I'm going to uh, talk about inclusion. So it's one of the big questions that we get from parents. Um, and actually just from the community in general. So I've organized this talk around the kind of common questions that we hear a lot um, about. So the, the concern is that for a lot of kids with autism, they have social difficulties which become very much pronounced in natural settings like, or community settings like school. So they might have difficulty just interacting with peers. They may have difficulty um, developing a friendship. Um, and they have trouble sometimes just adapting to new situations. So the three common questions. The, one, the first is um, we hear parents say, you know, I want my child to learn from other children. So is inclusion the best place for her to make friends? And so it might be. But I think the thing that we don't often consider are these two theoretical frames for how we think about how we develop relationships. So the first one is propinquity. So um, children are going to be, are more likely to be friends um, with others that they come in contact with, right? So you can imagine geographical compatibility is important. It's important to us too, right? You're not going to meet your husband or your wife or your partner. Um, if you never meet them by sort of interacting in the same city or the same location. So co-location is really important. Um, the second um, theoretical idea is that um, children are going to connect to other children on common interests, right? So either you have similar characteristics like age, gender, cultural background, or just interests in the same thing. So imagine your friends, right? Homophily refers to the fact that we share some kind of common interests. So propinquity and homophily are really important in thinking about the development of relationships with other people. So I'm going to now give you some of the research we've done um, at UCLA. So we. Um, had a study that was uh, about 137 children with ASD. They were kindergarten to fifth graders. They were across five different sites in the United States. And we were really interested in whether or not if we um, did a group um, situation at school, if all of the children had autism and they were from different classrooms, kind of similar to a clinic-based approach where the kids don't necessarily even go to the same school, they wouldn't necessarily know each other. So we put those kids together in one um, situation and then for other children they got randomized to being with a, um, a, a dissimilar group, so typical kids and kids with autism from the same classroom. So in so our hypothesis was that if you're in the same classroom, you've got propinquity, and we're going to have a group where we're going to develop those common interests, so we have homophily. And we predicted that those kids in the engaged group were going to be better friends on the playground. Um, but we also, um, in the, the clinic-based group where the kids were all kids with autism, we gave them kind of a more didactic skills group. So teaching them how do you enter a group, how do you start a conversation, um, how do you keep it going, those kinds of things. So what we found, surprisingly, was that the skills group, the didactic group where the kids didn't even know each other, but were in the same school, was more effective for improving playground engagement. So when we had blinded observers go out to the playground, they saw that the kids who got the skills group were more engaged with each other. So the exact opposite of what we predicted. Um, but we also found out that the teacher relationship was really important. So if you had a poor relationship with your teacher um, in your classroom, you did better in that skills group than if you had a good relationship, then you did better in the engaged group. All right? So what can we take away from that study? First, inclusion may be the right placement for a lot of reasons and more than what I've even talked about um, with respect to this study. Children are probably going to connect to other children who are like themselves and this may actually be other kids with ASD and that's okay. Um, the issue is whether children have access to each other, so that propinquity. So for some kids, inclusion may be really important. Um, but equally important is that teacher support and relationship with the child. So it gives you a few different things to think about when you think about inclusion. Okay, 
So a second question that we get a lot um, from, especially from parents and actually from other, uh, from teachers, is that some people are concerned about the effect that my child, my child with autism, will have on the other children in the class, right? So is that really a concern? So the argument is that the time required of the teacher to help the child with autism is going to take time away from the other uh, children. Have you guys heard this before? Yeah. Um, and that the other children aren't going to be interested in playing with a child with autism, especially if the child has something unusual about them. So the common solution for this issue is to assign the child a one-to-one -one aid or shadow teacher, right? Um, and for many reasons, at least from our work, this may be the most restrictive solution. That it really does take the child out of the mainstream because it marks the child. And unless that aid is very good about backing off and not marking the child, um, that child will be identified. So in that sense, it can be very restrictive. Now there are, of course, lots of reasons why a child might need a one-on-one -on -one aid, especially if they elope. So I'm not saying that, you know, there are lots of reasons why this, this decision gets made, but it's one thing to think about. Um, and then teacher behavior in that classroom really has more to do with the teacher than the child in terms of, of how the kids interact with each other in the classroom. So we were interested in whether or not um, if you assign um, buddies or, or peer buddies to a child with autism, which is kind of a common practice in schools, if that has a negative effect on the typical kids. And so we had done a study where um, we had done that. We had taken three typical peers from the same classroom as a kid with autism, and then we, we taught them how to engage all kids on the playground who were having difficulty socializing. So we were, um, it, interested in you know who those kids were that got selected as peer buddies and then what happened to them over the course of the intervention. So we had 107 typically developing peer models, these were elementary school kids, compared to 107 non-peer models from the same classroom. So the characteristics of the kids who were selected as peer buddies um, were that those peer models actually were more highly con connected in the classroom based on social networks. They received a lot more friend nominations, right? So a lot of kids in the class were saying, yeah, those kids are really popular, we really like that kid, All right? So that was true. Um, but those kids were not any different from the non-peer models in terms of having a best friend, in terms of reciprocity, or in terms of being rejected uh, by the peer group, or in terms of their own feelings of loneliness at school. Okay, so there were a lot of similarities, but they were pretty connected kids. Um, and then when they participated in research as a peer buddy, they stayed at exactly at the same level of popularity or they actually improved. So there were no negative effects on the typical peer buddies. And in fact, we had to turn kids away because we could only have about three kids that we could manage in this particular intervention. And we had many more kids who wanted to be part of that peer group. And so one of the things that we recommend is that those groups actually change over the course of the year because a lot of kids want to be those little ambassadors that help kids on the playground. So what we can take away from this study um, is that peers who befriend a child with ASD have really special benefits of that, that engagement. They tend to be highly connected. They tend to be uh, more popular children, although they're not always. In fact, some teachers will assign peer buddies of other children they're concerned with. Um, so every once in a while, we get um, kids who actually benefit in more ways um, than the, the usual typical child. Um, and then their popularity remains stable, or it actually improves over time. OK, and the third question is, my, um, my child needs help with social skills and making friends. So what interventions actually work? Do you guys have questions about that? Because social skills are really popular in the community. So there are a lot of manuals that have been published. You're going to hear about the um, children's friendship training, which is um, peers um, as well for older kids. Um, this afternoon. So that's one that's evidence-based, that's actually been tested, not in schools, but in clinic settings. Um, and then there are a couple of others that have um, some uh, evidence. There's actually one that's incredibly uh, popular called social thinking, 
which is Michelle Garcia Wimmer's work, never been tested. No research conducted on it, and yet it makes perfect sense and it seems like you know, a good packaged intervention. So a lot of these interventions share some common elements, but most of them have not been carried out in school settings. They're carried out in clinic settings. So when you think about being in a school setting, we wonder if we should work with the peers in the classroom or the school, or if we should work with an adult with that child one-on-one. -on -one. So we actually did a study where we compared uh, those two. So we had 60 children, all fully included, so you know, they're verbal children. Um, they were either randomized to get a peer-mediated intervention, an adult child one-on-one -on -one intervention, the combination of those two interventions, or just inclusion with no um, intervention from us. And the outcomes that we were interested in were um, peer social networks, which we collected from all kids in the classroom, um, and then peer engagement on the playground. So we basically had students from UCLA going to the playground once a week, knowing what the picture of the child looked like, finding that child, and rating their play behavior. They were like spying, right, <laughs> on the child when the interventionists weren't there. So we had that in addition to the information that we gathered from kids, from teachers, from parents, um, and from the peer uh, group. All right, so the child-assisted approach or the peer-mediated approach were the two basic components that we compared, and it was modular and individualized. Child-assisted was, you know, we went out there as researchers, we observed this child on the playground, we figured out from that observation, teacher reports, peer networks, self-reports, a lot of information. We figured out what the top three problems were. So maybe the child had trouble entering a play group, or maybe the child was aggressive, or maybe the child isolated himself, right? Went to the library. We have a lot of kids like that. Um, and then we worked on those problems with an adult researcher one-on-one, -on -one, twice a week for 20 minutes each session for only six weeks, 12 sessions. Right? This is what we thought was going to really work, right? Because we, we were there. We knew what the problems were. We were going to fix those problems. The other one was peer mediated, and we got three kids willing to participate from the class, which again was no problem. We had the peers identify some children on the playground who were having problems. We never talked about autism. We never identified our target child. We just said, you know, are there kids that, you know, don't play with other kids or have, don't know the games or whatever? We had those peers generate um, ideas to help the children engage, right? Because if you've been to a playground, you know that they're all different. The games are different. What kids are expecting to do are different. And so who's better to determine what the issues are than the kids themselves? And then we collected information from all the kids in the class. You know, it's strange. Now I can see you guys. Before, it's like I don't even see you. Isn't that weird? <laughs> um, and so we would ask all the kids in the class, with permission, to tell us who hangs out with whom on the playground. And so they would write down the names of kids who hung out together, and they would circle them. Girls and boys, they put themselves in groups. They also told us who, they, who their best friends were, uh, who they liked to hang out with, and who they didn't like to hang out with. And so from that, you get all this information, right? You get these networks of kids. So these numbers tell us how popular the, the group is. This is a pretty popular group, meaning that all the kids said, hey, this group really hangs out together. They're solid. This little guy is a guy with autism, and he's hanging on to Aubin, who, I know, I took all of my research, <laughs> my, my collaborators' names are all here. <laughs> well. Avin is a good friend to Sam. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but he's not very integrated into the groups, but he's hanging on to one kid, and everyone sees those two as hanging out together. We have, oh, me, I'm an isolate. <laughs> I don't hang out with anybody. Um, and so people said, you know, I hung out with maybe three of these groups, but nothing consistent, so I'm, I'm more isolated. So Connie and Sarah don't really have uh, a lot of friends, but we're not uh, kids with autism. All right. And so what we find from this work is that we can um, tell which kids are isolated, 
Kids who are peripheral to groups, so maybe hanging on to one friend or onto the edge of a group. Those kids who are secondary, so you know, doing just fine. That's where most of our kids are, where we want them to be. And then kids who are nuclear or popular, so the super popular kids. And so this black line are the typical kids, and these are kids with autism, and this is based on, you know, we've seen hundreds of kids with autism now and thousands of typical kids in these um, data. And the, the results are consistent each time. Um, so what we typically find is that some of our kids with autism are the most popular kids in the class but a small percentage, clearly not as many as the typical kids in the class. The majority of our kids with autism are what we call peripheral. So they're kind of on the edge of things, but they're not so, whoops, they're not so isolated. There are, there's a small percentage of kids who really are isolated, but it's not overwhelming. Are you surprised? Right, because you would think, right, based on anecdotal reports that our kids would be super isolated, and they're really not in schools. Okay, so what we learned from this was that intervening with the peers made the most difference in engaging um, children with ASD. And so you can see that over a six week period of time, if you were in the combination intervention or just the peer mediated, you did better after six weeks. So your social network, in other words, we moved you from being isolated or peripheral to more um, nuclear positions in the social networks. And then that maintained over a three-month follow-up. And kids who had the one-on-one -on -one adult were no different than having nothing, just having inclusion, right? And it surprised us because I hypothesized that we, of course, were going to make the difference. Um, and so this is what it looks like. So this little girl was isolated when we started at baseline, when we came back in six weeks. She's connected now to a group. She got the peer-mediated intervention. We come back in three months and she's still connected. There is movement, right? Kids move over the course of a year, um, but it's not drastic usually. Um, so there are changes, but. All right, so uh, we also found out from this um, intervention, which was really brief, is that the number of received friend nominations was greater for kids who got the peer-mediated intervention. They were less isolated on the playground, and the teachers rated their social skills better in the classroom, even though the teachers didn't even know which intervention they were in. They were not involved. But there were also limits, right? So if the child was connected to other children and had a reciprocate, reciprocated friend in class, so they had a best friend. They were pretty connected on the social networks. When we looked on the playground, they were no more engaged than any of the other kids, right? So interventions, we decided, needed to be conducted on the playground, that this is an environment which in and of itself is difficult for our kiddos. So we've done um, a playground-specific intervention called Remaking Recess. You can download it from the website. It's information um, for teachers or for paraprofessional aides on things you can do to engage kids on the playground. And we've done a waitlist control where we had some schools wait and some schools get the immediate treatment. We train paraprofessional aides, recess aides, on the playground. Um, to, with some very simple strategies on how to engage kids. And those kids improved on blinded observations on the playground, right? So when we go out there and we measure engagement by people who aren't involved in the intervention, those kids are increasing in their engagement and kids in the wait list are still waiting. So the strategies are simple and they seem to work. All right. So, one of the things that we've done, so I work in a, a lot in Los Angeles Unified School District, and you know, there's a lot of variability. We try to get people engaged, and you know that works in some uh, settings better than others, but what's best is if you can get the school personnel involved. So I'm gonna show you a video of one of our principals who is modeling the intervention, and he's amazing. So if anybody is at Esperanza Elementary School, he's an amazing principal.
Right, so we also use these social menus to try to get kids more engaged during lunchtime because a lot of times our kids were sitting on the edge. And so they're just a little, we call them chat times and they have jokes and things on and kids love them. Actually, the, most of the kids love them that actually don't have autism. They're the ones who are constantly wanting to do it. But you can see that he's a very engaged principal. We'd like to see more uh, school staff that are like that. He's pretty amazing. Um, and you probably couldn't tell who had autism in that group, right? So it's a full inclusion school. They have a number of kids that have uh, different uh, challenges. All right, so what matters? So peers matter, right? But we need to consider homophily and propinquity as we think about placement. And then we need to think about those interventions to happen where you expect the change. So it may be on the playground itself, it may be in the classroom, but it's probably at school or in the community. So we need to think about that. So clinic-based uh, social skills interventions can be very important, but we need to make sure that those are generalizing and transferring to community settings. And then the approach that you choose has to fit the situation. So there's probably not a single effective intervention. And in fact, your child may need multiple interventions. So Amanda had just talked about the SMART design. And we're, we actually just completed one with um, the peer-mediated work. So we, we thought about doing um, environmental change first. So we gave an intervention. Well, everybody got the intervention on the playground, remaking recess. And then the other half also got an intervention in the classroom for social skills. We went along for three months and then we made a change. We randomized kids to either get a peer-mediated intervention in addition or they got a parent how to have a play date at home intervention. And then after another three months we determined who was, de uh, who was developing slowly in, in regards to social interactions. Um, and we um, gave them more intensity by giving them kind of the kitchen sink. And other kids who are doing well, we just let well enough be, a lot, you know, be the same. So that we can start to look at the sequencing of treatments and, and for whom uh, the intervention needs to be shifted, right? So some kids need a lot of, of intensity in interventions or change up in intervention. Other kids just need a little bit and they're gonna do fine. And we can use our resources much better if we can use these kind of designs to determine um, at the very beginning what kids need. All right, thank you.